with the CVSD Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. Um, and our other counselor, Brenda Rachels, is here as well, and she will be facilitating the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, we're so excited to have you guys here tonight. And um, just wanted to let you all know this meeting will be recorded and will be posted on the CVSD YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A section and we will do our best as, um, to answer as many questions as possible tonight. Our presenter, Todd Walker, who we're so excited to have here, will be sharing practical strategies for supporting the mental health needs of your LGBTQ child. Um, Todd is a licensed clinical social worker who works with children, teens, and families, and he has provided LGBTQ trainings in neighboring communities for teachers, parents, and students. So we're so excited that he's here tonight providing this training for us. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Todd. Might, might help if I unmute myself. <laughs> Got, gotta, gotta love technology, right? Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. So <clears throat> we're uh, going to spend some time tonight talking about how we can support um, LGBTQ students. So just a little bit about here we go, uh, some of our learning objectives. So um, we're gonna go over LGBTQ plus 101. We're gonna talk about some of the affirming and non-affirming behaviors, uh, some of the local and national stats, specific mental health concerns. What can we as parents, adults, guardians do to support and help the community? And then um, we'll go over some of the resources that are local to us, as well as finish up with some questions and discussion. So, um, Without further ado, here we go. Okay, so this is my friend, the genderbred. Um, I use this tool when I work with this population specifically to just get a sense of um, what's going on and where are things coming from, and it's a great visual aid. So um, I'm gonna do the best as I can is this is a very interactive training, so um, it's a little difficult visually, but here we go. So um, when we talk about, uh, we always start with sex assignments at birth. So when we're talking about that, we're really referring to biological sex. So what's going on between, in between a person's legs? Do they identify as male or female? Then we have gender identity. So this inner sense of gender, do I see myself more as a man, more as a woman, or more as gender queer? From there, we typically look at gender expression. So how am I expressing and communicating my gender? Am I doing this in a masculine way, a feminine way, or an androgynous way? And then lastly, looking at sexual orientation. So who am I romantically, physically, and emotionally attracted to? A previous definition that would have been utilized is who we want to go to bed with. And really we wanna separate that because that more pertains to the physical act of sexual orientation, not so much again, that idea of attraction. So, Taking a bit of a deeper dive, um, again, looking at sex assignment at birth. So again, our, our anatomy, our, our biological sex. Um, are we identified as male, female, or intersex? Intersex is a combination of the chromosomes. We know that there are 40 variations um, of what research tells us of how an individual can identify as intersex. And this um, would be identified by a physician as well. Then we again have gender identity. So this inner sense of gender, do I see myself more as a man, more as a woman, or more as gender queer? Uh, again, gender expression. So how am I expressing and communicating my gender? Am I doing it in a masculine way, a feminine way, or an androgynous way? And then lastly, sexual orientation. So again, looking at this idea of attraction, who am I romantically, physically, and emotionally attracted to? So some additional terms here. Um, with heterosexual, how do we define that? So a person who is attracted to the opposite gender. With bisexual, they, this individual would be attracted to their own gender as well as an additional gender. And then lastly, lesbian and gay. So being attracted to the same gender that I myself identify with. Um, some additional terms here. Uh, looking at cisgender. So when we're talking about cisgender, we're talking about an individual who has um, their sex assignment at birth as well as their gender identity link up. So for myself, I identify as a cisgender man because my biological sex is male and my gender identity is man. When we have a person who identifies as transgender, their sex assignment and gender identity don't link up. 
So if I identified as transgender, my sex assignment at birth might be male, in which case my gender identity could be woman. So that's, <clears throat> that's an example of what a transgender individual might come forth with. Um, in addition, when we're talking about um, when, when do these things develop? So looking at gender identity, typically gender identity is developed between the ages of about two to six. And then sexual orientation, we usually see around the ages of six to 12. Now, always want to just preface this, that these age ranges are not locked in. So obviously it can, it can vary across each individual. Um, okay. So a little bit more about attraction and gender. So when we're talking about gender identity, expression and sexual orientation, these things are not determined by body parts. Um, they're also distinct from one another. So we don't need gender identity to have expression, to have orientation. Each of these things operate independently of themselves. Um, in addition, we really want to avoid assumptions, especially with this community. So what that means and what that looks like is, you know, if you have an individual who let's say maybe dresses differently than what we would consider the typical norm, doesn't necessarily mean that that individual identifies as LGBT. So in those situations, I think it's really important that we do our best to avoid assumptions. And then lastly, again, this idea that it's different than sexual behavior. So really looking at sexual orientation being about attraction and not about sexual behavior. Okay, so taking a look at some of the non-affirming behaviors and how this can negatively impact specifically this community, um, this can also be referred to as rejecting behaviors. So behaviors such as blaming, you know, blaming a youth for being LGBT, um, shaming them, uh, excluding them. So as an example, you know, hey Todd, you're not able to come to this event because you're LGBT. And then lastly, name calling. What we see is these unhealthy outcomes can, I'm sorry, these, uh, these non-affirming behaviors can lead to unhealthy outcomes such as attempted suicide, uh, high levels of depression, high risk of HIV, STDs, STIs, and then lastly, use of illegal drugs. Um, some of the questions I typically get are uh, STDs and STIs, what do they stand for? So for STDs, it's sexually transmitted disease, diseases, and for STIs, it's sexually transmitted infections. Now, in regard to HIV, we have made significant progress where this is concerned. Um, for those of you who may be familiar, there are two medications out on the market um, referred to as PrEP and PEP. PEP is utilized if a person believes they have contracted HIV, they can utilize PEP and be cleared of the virus within 72 hours. Uh, PrEP is a medication that can be taken daily uh, where a person can be protected against HIV specifically. So looking at some of, um, some of these statistics. So, and I've got, <clears throat> in addition to what I provided here, I've got some additional resources at the end as well as where a lot of this information comes from. So that'll be shared a little bit later. Um, but looking specifically, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual youth seriously contemplate suicide at almost three times the rate of their heterosexual counterparts. Uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual youth are also um, five times as likely to have attempted suicide compared to their heterosexual peers. One of the things that I really want to separate for the first two bullets, the difference between contemplate and attempt. So contemplate is more of the thinking about suicide, where attempt is the, the actual attempt of it. Um, going to the third bullet, of all suicide attempts made by youth, lesbian, gay, bisexual youth, suicide attempts were almost five times as likely to require medical treatment. When we're talking about medical treatment, we're referring to having to go seek treatment from a physician, emergency room, urgent care, so on and so forth. And then lastly, in 2016, there was a survey that was conducted by the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign. Um, where they found that 20%, 28% of LGBTQ youth, including 40% of trans youth, said they felt depressed most or all of the time during the past 30 days, compared to only 12% of their non-LGBTQ youth. Um, just a couple of additional stats. So in a national study, 40% of trans adults reported having made a suicide attempt, of which 92% of these individuals reported having attempted suicide before the age of 25. Um, further, LGB <clears throat> youth who come from highly rejecting families are eight and a half times as likely 
to have attempted suicide as LGB peers who reported uh, no or low levels of family rejection. And then lastly, each episode of LGBT victimization, such as physical, verbal harassment or abuse, increases the likelihood of self-harming behaviors by two and a half times on average. So going a little bit more into some of the coming out challenges, and then we'll talk a little bit about benefits. Um, we do see often a lot of internalized bias, um, fear of losing loved ones. You know, if I tell my parents, I may get told that I can't be at home anymore, that my parents don't love me anymore because of this. Um, fear of rejection, of judgment, violence. And then lastly, which is a huge issue in this um, particular population is fear of losing vital resources. We see across both Los Angeles County, the foster care system, as well as the national foster care system, that about 40% of homeless youth do identify as LGBTQ. So this is definitely something that we want to pay attention to and look at what are some of the things that we can do to change some of our behaviors and the language we utilize around working with this population. So talking about some of the benefits, you know, we see empowerment, we see increased self-esteem, increased self-esteem. We also see just stronger relationships with siblings, with family, with peers. Um, and I think one of the things that's, at least from my perspective and the work I've done is a significant reduction in the stress of hiding. Um, one of the things I always think about is us as adults, you know, we know what it's like to keep secrets, we can function with secrets, but it's pretty incredible when you think about a child who is, let's say 10 years old, and really has to hold this stuff in and doesn't know whether or not they're in a safe environment to really be able to come out and share what's going on for them to be able to seek some of that guidance and help. So, um, yeah, yeah. Todd, we have Sorry, um, one of our participants, can you hear me? Um, yes. One of our participants is asking if you could explain a little bit what internalized bias is. Yes, absolutely. So, in the per and thank you for the question, Brenda. So, with internalized bias, it's what's going on inside. Um, I'm not supposed to be this way. I shouldn't be gay. I shouldn't be LGBT. Um, if an individual has a certain upbringing, or they may associate, I see it often, um, with religion. If religion is, is very, the type of religion that the individual um, associates with is maybe anti-LGBT, that that often can come up a lot, that they really just don't want, this isn't supposed to be a part of me, it isn't supposed to be a part of who I am. So really, really good question. And if, if they're more along the way, feel free to, to jump in. Um, so taking a look at some of the affirming behaviors and how this can, can positively impact this community. So offering support, offering advocacy and expressing affection are huge. And we see higher self-esteem, again, this idea of closer relationships and just really better overall health, the, the belief that they can be a healthy, happy adult. Um, one of the things that, that I've truly enjoyed in working with this population is being able to really be a significant role model for the possibility that um, being LGBT doesn't mean that you don't have access to the same things that other folks do. So, so that I think is um, for me definitely huge of how can we really get some of those role models out there to show that this is, that being LGBT is okay. So what to say, what, what do we do when, when this information is brought to our attention? Um, these are definitely suggestions. I'm gonna go into detail all of the different options and what's available. So definitely um, I'll, I'll kind of go over what this can look like and um, what has come up in my experience to kind of help guide some of this conversation. So thank you for trusting me with this information. How has your experience been so far? I, I can't stress enough letting the youth lead the conversation, um, which can be really difficult as a parent, as an adult in the situation, because a lot of us, are, our nature is to immediately protect and, and help, help make sure they're okay and, and so on and so forth. Um, let me know how I can support you versus how can I support you? The difference between those two statements and questions how I can support you is more in the moment, but letting me know how I can support you allows the conversation to continue. And that's something that also, especially as, as a guardian, as a parent, an adult, what have you, it's really important that we keep 
the conversation going. And we don't necessarily um, put a wall up, if you will, that, you know, hey, I'm in this moment and I can ask this question, but once we're done, we're gonna move on. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna table this conversation. Um, how do you want me to refer to you in front of others is an extremely vital question to ask, especially because determining the, um, the individual's level of outness, you know, are they out to simply just you, the person they've told? Have they shared this with a couple of friends or a teacher or whatever the case be? So really making sure that that question is a part of the conversation. Um, who else are you out to and who would you like to be out to? I always provide some caution, especially because I do wanna give parents the benefit of the doubt that sometimes a lot of information can be shared in this initial conversation. And I think what's important is I definitely wanna give parents that opportunity that it is totally okay for you to let your child know that you've kind of hit your limit because this can be a lot of information. And it's, it's absolutely fine, I can't stress this enough, to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to use poor Brenda and Becca as an example because they're here, you know, hey, Brenda, I'm loving this conversation, but I, I need a minute. I need a minute to just take a deep breath and process some of this. Can, can we reconvene in an hour? You know, that that is totally okay um, because ultimately there can be a lot of information. And sometimes for some of us, it's just difficult to kind of contain all of it, especially if it's brand new. Um, would it be all right if I shared this with a parent, with a grandparent, with a sibling, so on and so forth. An extremely important, again, question to ask solely because where is the individual at? You know, are they ready to share their story with others or is this something that they want to keep between your, yourself and, and the child? Um, and then lastly, it's such a great opportunity to praise that kiddo. Um, you're really courageous for coming out, for telling me, for trusting me. Um, because this is not an easy conversation. Um, you know, I can, I can remember, you know, just working with different youth over the years that, you know, these conversations, they're, they're not easy to have, especially because, you know, in a lot of cases, um, they're, they're coming out certainly at a younger age than I was accustomed to, um, you know, being fully transparent. I came out when I was 18. I now work with individuals who are in elementary school, which is phenomenal to me. Um, but I think it also speaks to how far we've come as a society and really being able to look at, you know, some of um, the media that's out there and, you know, the TV shows, if you will, that really just um, show wonderful pictures of families and what they can look like and so on and so forth that, again, just create these really safe spaces. So talking about, um, talking about language and how we can make an impact. So Terms like lifestyle, choice, popular, phase, these, these types of words are gonna convey a sense of bias. So I really encourage that self-definition is key and reflecting the child's terminology is, is vital um, to really having a good, healthy conversation. Using inclusive gender neutral language is also a positive. Um, what that can look like in the parent setting, you know, I can remember growing up, um, I'm one of five boys and I'm the youngest. So I remember so much, you know, my parents telling me, oh my gosh, you know, when all of you grow up, you're all going to have wives, you're all going to have kids, everyone's going to have a house with the white picket fence. Um, the difficulty is, is when I grew up, I didn't understand that conversation. I didn't understand those words because and what it really led to for me was a lot of confusion because I would hear my parents saying that, but then in my head, it was like, wait a second, this isn't, this, this isn't matching up for me. So saying, saying things like when you grow up and you, you get married and you are with someone special, you know, keeping it more gender neutral. Now with that said, it doesn't also mean, and I want to stress this for all parents, doesn't mean that your youth is LGBT, doesn't mean that all youth are LGBT. To me, what this is more about is allowing the youth to have their journey regardless of what, what journey that may be. Um, talking about appropriate gender pronouns, you know, she, her, hers, he, him, his, so on and so forth. I do get a lot of questions about no pronoun and what does that mean? So no pronoun, um, what that essentially entails is if I introduced myself and I said, my name is Todd and I go by Todd and I don't use pronouns. That essentially means that when I'm addressed, my ask is that I'm addressed as Todd. 
Um, if I were to use pronouns, I might say, you know, hi, Becca and Brenda, my name is Todd and I go by he, him and his. So what that entails is that I'm requesting, not requiring, but requesting that when Becca and Brenda address me that they use my preferred pronouns. With that said, and I can't stress this enough for parents and adults, we make mistakes. And it's a fabulous opportunity to model for our kids that we screw up just as much as they do. <laughs> so being able to say, you know, hey, Todd, I, I'm so sorry, you know, I made a mistake on the pronouns. I'm going to do my best to correct that in the future. Uh, I remind this with a lot of the youth that I work, work with that often come in with a lot of frustrations, you know, oh my gosh, my mom keeps me misgendering me and calling me by the wrong name and so on and so forth. And, you know, for me, it's often that friendly reminder because I want so much to support parents also in this process. Hey, parents found out a month ago, give them a moment. <laughs> So it, it really about taking time and, and making this a positive experience for everyone. Todd, we have another question. Yeah, please. Um, the question is, how do I help my child, my children understand my daughter is now identifying as a male by a different name? So to me, it's um, one of the things, and, and Brenda, I'll, I'll answer this more um, more generally, just because of, of not knowing age range. So to me, when it comes to this situation, um, I always take into account, it, you know, we wanna use age appropriate language. With that said, I'm gonna address this very differently versus like, let's say a kindergartner versus a high schooler um, who maybe has a bit more understanding and just a little more development to understand. So to me in the, that situation, I personally, personally believe there's not a lot that needs to be shared. Um, what I often will recommend to parents in those situations is, you know, hey, um, um, Todd is now going to be referred to as Sarah. So we want to do our best to call Todd by Sarah moving forward. And it really is as simple as that. Um, my experience working especially with kids and, and more, so, <laughs> more so at the elementary and middle school level, they don't tend to have a lot of questions. Um, you know, I, working with the various, pop, various school districts that I've worked in over the years, um, it's funny, but often, and I've been in various settings where I've been able to support school systems in transitions, I, I often find, I, years ago, I was working with a third grade classroom where um, a student transitioned over winter break. And literally, the hot topic for the kids was they wanted to know that the kid was still able to play soccer at recess. They could care less about the name. It was literally like, wait a minute, Johnny can still play soccer, right? Like, all good on the name, we wanna know that Johnny can play soccer. So that's normally been my experience. And I think to me, it's how we can also, I'm gonna use the word contain, how we can really contain the situation. The bigger we make it as adults, the more confused our kids are gonna be. So if we really provide simple, direct um, feedback, it actually can be rather simple for kids to understand what's going on. And worst case scenario, <clears throat> if a kid comes back and says, wait a second, like I've got questions, it is also totally appropriate for a parent or adult to say, you know what, at this time, we're not ready for questions. We're gonna respect Todd and go by Sarah. And that's it. Okay. So looking at really good questions, by the way, um, looking at resources. So PFLAG, for those of you who don't know, is fantastic. It's right here in Oak Park. Um, and uh, you can access it literally by, you know, Googling PFLAG Oak Park. Um, they have been around for years. They run their groups. Uh, it's the second Monday of each month at 730. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and I've been working with them off and on for the last 10 years, uh, they have never had a dark month. So literally that group is always on. If the facilitator can't facilitate, they find someone who can do it, uh, which is fantastic. And they're, they're lovely. It's a great group of people. Um, in addition, Psychology Today is also fantastic. Psychology Today is a website that is utilized if you're a family who maybe needs additional support. It's a great place to access a mental health provider. Um, you also, which I love, you can be very specific about the type of, you know, if you're a family who maybe wants to use their insurance, 
Um, you can actually filter your insurance. You can also filter the clinician's expertise. Um, this also, just making this more general, is a great resource for everything other than LGBT as well. Um, if you know you have a student who maybe has some anxiety or has some depression, it's also a great resource for that too. Um, the local teen centers are absolutely fantastic in the Thousand Oaks community. Thousand Oaks as well as Agora does a wonderful job, so it's a great place to also send, um, send teens. Um, Los Angeles LGBT Center, little far. I know it's not necessarily around the corner for us here in Thousand Oaks, but despite, despite the point, they have wonderful resources on their website, um, programs, groups, et cetera, that are, that are accessible to both um, individuals as well as families. So they're fantastic. Um, GSAs at the high schools, uh, the Gay Straight Alliances. I know over the years, you know, sometimes there's significant student involvement, sometimes not so much. Um, but all in all, it's a great place for high school students to be able to go. You don't have to be LGBT to be a part of it. You also can be an ally to the community. Um, Children's Hospital Los Angeles, um, sometimes referred to as CHLA, is also wonderful. Again, I know it's not around the corner, but they are fantastic. Um, I've had a lot of clients that I've seen over the years that have accessed them. I get nothing but wonderful feedback. Um, transcaresite.org is also another great resource. Um, I've referred a few of my clients to utilize it and they report back that they enjoy it. Um, it's a great place of where you can go and find a physician in the community who actually treats the trans population. Um, so another great resource as well. And then when all else fails, there is always Google. Um, Google, I have to say, is just a great resource in general, and part of the reason I, I recommend it is, um, and why all these resources are somewhat different, for me as a clinician, I really want to respect the fact that all of us come from different backgrounds. Um, not all of us are comfortable reaching out to our school or our teacher or our counselor for help. Um, with that said, a clinician or even a physician, you know, we're not always comfortable doing that. So one of the places of why I think Google is so great is if you're somebody who maybe is more of a reader and wants to be able to read about um, LGBT, it's a great place to be able to do that as well. So um, with that said, I just a little information about um, my organization, Alba Walker Life Strategies. Uh, we are an LGBT organization. Um, we have about 50 clinicians who do work with us. Um, that are under my direct supervision. So with that said, we are very LGBT affirming um, and really support this community and working with it. All of our services now are provided via telehealth. Um, so we really have taken our organization statewide. We also have multilingual capa language capacity. So uh, we offer services in English, Spanish, German, Farsi. Um, we also have uh, French and Polish as well. Um, so if anybody um, has any interest in services, that is our direct contact. Um, we do accept a variety of different insurances such as Kaiser, Anthem, Gold Coast Health Plan, et cetera. Um, and with that said, I, I'd love to get some questions. Um, I do have, I, I can pop over to just my contact information if anybody is interested, but I'm more than happy to um, take questions at this time if anybody has any. Yeah, I've got um, two regarding the resources and then we'll go on to some other ones, Todd. Um, specifically, yeah. I have someone asking about um, a PFLAG LGBT group that meets in Oak Park, if you have any information on that, as well as Rainbow Umbrella in Ventura. So for um, what I would recommend, I, I do, I do have the contact information. So um, would it be best, Becca, to maybe send it like the link to you and it can be provided to, is that something we can do or? Yeah, so yeah. Um, we actually do have um, P5 listed on our community resource sheet. So that's oh. another way to access that. It's a direct link to their website. Oh, great. Okay. I'm, I mean, so then is, I'm assuming that's, I'm happy to provide it, but if that's good enough, we're, whatever works. Awesome. And you know what I can do is at the end of the presentation, probably tomorrow, I can send um, a, a link with these resources on them. Oh, perfect. Awesome. 
What was the, uh, go ahead, Brenda, I know there was another question. Oh, did you have any um, feedback on Rainbow Umbrella? Just kind of wondering um, if there is anything that you knew about that group as well. I, I don't know anything specifically. Um, I have, I typically, when it comes to resources in general, um, I each, when I, when I refer clients to stuff, I, to me, it's more about like, this is what I've heard from parents that I've referred, um, but I always encourage, check it out yourself. T to me, when it comes to resources, I can't stress enough, do, do the work. Because to me, you know, my experience is you could refer 10 clients to the same organization. Each of them will come back with different feedback. Um, you know, I've heard great things about CHLA, but I've also heard great things about UCLA Medical Center. Um, UCLA tends to be what parents have reported to me, uh, very friendly to LGBT, especially the trans community, tends to be a bit more, um, I'm going to use what <laughs> the words that my parents have used with me, that it's more toned down for them, where CHLA, you are walking into more of you know, the, the rainbows and the signs and all of that. And, you know, to me, I take that to heart because I want my parents and my clients to have a really positive experience. So to me, the best thing I can say with resources is, you know, you've got to really get out there and see, see what works for you and your, and your child and the family, you know? So. Great. Um, okay, so I got a couple more questions for you. Um, my child came out to me, do I need to tell everyone? Yeah, that is that is a question I get often. Um, to me, <clears throat> I think again, going back to, um, let me actually, I'm gonna pull it up because I wanna be able to reference the, um, I wanted to be able to see everybody, but then of course I remembered that <laughs> it's just us. So um, going back to, Give me just a moment. There we go. Um, really going back to, you know, asking some of these questions, I think is critical. Um, you know, the short answer is no. I don't think you need to tell everybody. Um, often my experience in this situation is sometimes uh, kids that I've worked with, it's already been shared. So that often is what I am met with when parents do come to access services that like, oh my gosh, Todd, you know, I found out my, my child is identifying as LGBT, but like it's already, you know, Channel 4 News knows about it, Facebook knows about it. So sometimes that's, that's part of the equation, but by no means does everybody need to know. I, I don't believe that. I think it's really about having a conversation with the immediate family and really talking about, you know, what makes sense for us. And just reminding everybody that from my perspective, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So... Yeah, good, very good question though, for sure. Okay. Um, the next one is my nearly 13 year old recently told me she thinks she's bi. How likely is it that she knows for sure at this age? Mm -hmm. It's, gosh, it's, um, I think again, you know, one of the things that I would think about, and I often tell tell parents that um, I, there are three words that I look at when an individual comes to me and shares what's going on for them. Are they persistent, consistent, and insistent? So to me, I think that's extremely important to look at. And I'll, I'll say that one more time because I know it's a mouthful. So insistent, persistent, and consistent. Because to me, you know, I've worked with a variety of different kids who will come see me and, you know, one day, you know, oh my gosh, Todd, I think I'm gay. But then the next day we're talking about, you know, action figures and Legos. So to me, I really take a look at clinically from my perspective as a clinician, that is this something that is an ongoing thing for them? I want to look at time frame. You know, if, if this uh, student came to me and said, you know, I think I might be bi, um, I might want to ask, you know, what makes you think that, you know, what's, what has been, and again, going back to some of these questions, you know, how has your experience been so far? What does this look like for you? I think a big thing when it comes to an individual identifying as LGBT is also understanding what is that for the youth. So um, one of the things I also might consider saying is, you know, hey, I think I might be bi. Okay, what does that look like for you? What does that mean to you? Because I think what also is important that when it comes to the education of all these terms is really understanding 
are we on the same page about the terms? Because I have, I have seen it where a youth will come to me and say they think they identify as something, but then when I ask them to explain what that means to them, it turns out it's something totally different. So I think it's also important that as adults, because in a way we do have more experience than they do, is how to be able to guide and talk about, you know, what does this look like and what does this mean? So. Okay, thank you. Um, next yeah, one. Awesome. How, how about with siblings? Say an older sibling has a younger sibling that has identified as transgender. How mm -hmm. do we best support both kids? So I'm, I'm sorry, I wanna make sure. So it's, it's so you have multiple, multiple kid household and one of the children identifies as trans. So how to support both? I just wanna make sure I have it right. Yeah, the, um, the younger sibling identifies as transgender and the parents wanting to know how can we support both of them? So to me, I, I always find those types of questions interesting because I think it's really important to, I think it's a great opportunity to, in a way, dispel the myth, if you will. Um, I get a lot of questions around, you know, in general, like, how do I, you know, I've got three kids and, and they've all got different needs and so on and so forth. To me, I would address any need like I would any child. So I think what's important is, are there gonna be times where maybe if you have a young, in this case, a younger sibling who does identify as trans, maybe there's gonna be a moment in time where that individual child needs a bit more attention, a bit more support. But at the same time, I think it's also important of how to make sure as parents and adults to kind of take a step back and make sure that we're also providing that even split because sometimes, and I have seen this, especially with sib sets, that, you know, there can be, you know, oh my gosh, you know, Todd, Todd is getting all the attention, you know, parents are spending all the time with him, they never hang out with me anymore. So I think what's important is always taking a look at that, you know, taking that step back um, to really just assess as a parent, you know, am I doing the best I can? And I want to stress that again, doing the best you can. We're, we're only human. We can't solve everything. <laughs> so, so again, really taking a look at, am, am I doing the best I can given what's going on, right? So really good question though. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, what if my child has come out to me but they don't want me to tell their dad? What do I do? Yeah, that's, that's very, it's, it's a tough one because there's a lot of dynamic there. So um, there's the dynamic of the, the you know, parent relationship to the child. Then there's the dynamic of the spousal relationship. And then also in a way, the relationship of that other parent to that child as well. So it's a lot of, um, in, in my world of mental health, a lot of triangulation that can happen. So um, I think what's important in those situations again is you know, using, and I've, I've got this slide up, really really being able to talk about and converse. Um, I think appropriate questions in that case are, you know, I'd wanna ask that youth, if it was me, um, you know, gosh, you know, again, thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate this. You know, I'm curious, what makes you think that, that this parent wouldn't understand or wouldn't be supportive? Because I think what's also important in that situation is really validating the feelings of the youth. Um, you know, I've had situations where, you know, I will have a youth who says, well, honestly, Todd, um, my parent at the dinner table every night talks about how they hate gay people. So in that situation, it does really complicate it. And it, it creates a lot of stress for the youth to be able to share that information because for them, they may view it as a very high risk, you know, going back to some of those, those um, non-affirming behaviors that for them, they may be concerned that sharing it could result in a, in a problem. So, um, you know, to me, I think what's important, especially as a parent, is continuing that dialogue. Continue asking questions um, and seeing what makes sense. So, and, and ultimately, sometimes as parents, and I've had this happen, you know, in my practice when I've worked with families, Sometimes there is no other option but to share it with the other parents. So it, it really, I, I can't stress enough, it's case by case. Okay. Um, 
do you have any advice for dealing with friends or family members who refuse to use the correct pronoun for our child due to their religious beliefs? It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's another, it's another complicated, <laughs> these are really good questions. It's another, it's another complicated area. Um, to me, again, and I, I apologize for prefacing it with this, but it really is case by case. Um, what, what I have seen and different, and, and I've had this, this is a very common, um, very common situation that I experience when I work with, with youth from this population. Um, again, goes back to dialogue, goes back to really talking about with the immediate family, you know, what does this look like? How do we want to do this? What are the steps of doing this? Trying to do the best we can to let the youth lead the conversation. But I also think in those situations, parents are fantastic allies because they know, you know, if we're talking about grandparents or we're talking about, you know, uncles and aunts, they know those, those relationship dynamics much better than we do as the kid. So, um, to me, I think, again, having the conversation, um, I have had scenarios where parents will meet with their parents and say, look, you know, here's where we are. This is our expectation moving forward. Um, I have seen parents that will come back to me and say, hey, you know what, we're going to have to take a break from grandma for the moment because grandma is just not in a place to be able to accept this. Um, but at the same time, I've also seen families that just, in a sense, make it work. Um, and really, as long as there is general respect, that's, I think, what's important. But um, I really go back to the conversation. I think what's so important is, you know, to me, my responsibility as a clinician is regardless of extended family, is the child and the parent on the same page? Because I think that's honestly what's so pivotal. Um, not that we don't want to have grandparents support and uncles and aunts and cousins and whatnot, but I think that immediate support system is so vital. Okay, another one for you. Uh, the parent is wondering if they should bring up the sexual orientation um, with their child from time to time, or should they just wait and you know wait for the child to bring it up to them when they're yeah. ready? I, I think it's a good question. I mean, to me, I, I'm gonna jump to this slide. I mean, I think this is where, this is where making that impact with language. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with a variety of different parents who, who will come to me and, and again, assume that their, their child might identify as LGBTQ. And um, I've seen a couple of parents over the years that, you know, will have stickers, have t-shirts, be really affirming in, in their home environment. To me, I think, I think that's enough. I, I really do. Um, it's, it's really the best thing we can do. And, and I go back to the idea of avoiding assumptions. You know, if you feel that you want to create an affirming home environment, that's fantastic. And it's more than enough. It doesn't mean that, you know, oh my gosh, Todd, I think you're gay. Are you gay? You got to tell me you're gay. I want you to be able to tell me you're gay. Um, to me that actually I've seen with, with youth I've worked with, it can kind of push them back a bit. Um, because again, I think it's so important that when the youth is ready, they share the information. And, and that kind of goes into the next question that we had, um, yeah. where the child knows they're supported by their parents. Um, the parents are wondering, like, should we be talking more? Like, how can we check in or should we be checking in with them? Totally, totally. I mean, again, I, I really think going back to using that inclusive language and just, just allowing the youth to have their journey. Um, I, I, I think what has changed so much in society today is we have so much more information. We have so much, so much more dialogue. We have trainings like these that are out there that allow parents to have more lingo. And, um, but at the same time, I think what's important and what I hear from youth and what they tell me is that it's very special to them to be able to share when they are ready. Um, you know, being fully transparent, I didn't have the opportunity to do that. I was outed. So I didn't have the opportunity to tell my parents. Uh, my parents found out. So it, it can really change the dynamic when, when those types of things happen. And, and to me, this is where, you know, I'm gonna stress that avoiding assumptions, 
just because an individual may present a certain way doesn't in fact mean they're LGBT. Okay, here's a question for you, another one. Okay. How do I talk to my daughter about her crush? <laughs> Love it. Um, I have a very, <laughs> I, I, I wish I could have the parent because I've got a great question for them. How would you talk to any child about a crush? So <clears throat> in that situation, I, I would really encourage um, parents to, again, take that step back. I, part of, part of what, what I get often when, um, when I work with this population and I get so many parents who come in and, you know, oh my gosh, I've, I've got three kids and all of, one, all of them want to have their significant others sleep over, but I don't know what to do because, you know, you know, so-and-so wants to have their girlfriend and their boyfriend, but then Todd wants to have his boyfriend. Should I tell him no? Um, to me, it really is taking a look at house rules, right? Like, what are the house rules when it comes to significant others sleeping over? Um, so to me, looking at a crush, a crush is general, whether it's one individual or the other. Um, but I, but often I, I do get that a lot from parents. So to me, I, I would kind of give it back that crushes or crushes. But I think this is where, and we talked about this a few minutes ago, how we as adults, if we can contain it and bring it down, kids are going to respond just fine. If, if we respond with, oh my gosh, what do I do? And, you know, I mean, this crush is different because it's not like this crush. It, it, it can really intensify the situation versus just making it like any other crush that, that we deal with with our kids on a daily basis. I, 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 can, I can think of, I, I saw my niece over the weekend who is a fourth grader. Uh, she claimed to me she had seven crushes this year. And literally my feedback was like, wow, you've been busy. You know, so it, it really goes back to, I mean, the more we give into it, I think kids often, it, you know, they look for those responses. They want to see our shock as adults. Um, where I think, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity again to just um, keep it simple, you know. Okay, how about um, addressing the need within a family of a, of, of a child that's LGBTQ and then another child that is cisgender? Like, how can I address both those needs? Are they different? Are they the same? Are there some, some things that are both similar and different? I, you know, I think in that sense, it really, it, it kind of goes back to being, being a bit case by case. Um, you know, to me, looking at, let's say, you know, in this particular situation, you have a youth who comes out to you. Those needs are going to look a little different in the sense of what do we do in that situation? You know, do we um, kind of everything we've talked about tonight, do we include extended family? Do we, if need be, involve the school setting? Do we need to involve the school setting? Um, looking at a, a child who identifies as cisgender, um, keep in mind that even if that child identifies as cisgender, may also be that they are LGBT as well. Keep in mind that when we're talking about cisgender, I identify as cisgender, but that has nothing to do with my LGBT identity. So keeping that in mind as well, that, that in that situation, I'm under the assumption that, that this particular family has a cisgender individual, but then maybe a trans individual. So again, the needs might be similar in the sense of like, are the kids having anxiety experiences in the school setting, right? To me, those are identical, right? It doesn't matter whether one is cisgender or one, one is LGBT. Depends on what the anxiety needs are, um, but something that would be different would be if an individual comes out as transgender, those needs might look different simply because where they are in the stage of their transition, you know, are they at the elementary level, high school level, middle school level, that's gonna also vary as well. So, and it could be an opportunity, just to kind of put it out there, is also, is it an opportunity to seek help? Is it an opportunity to come to, you know, a, a program like Breakthrough to maybe see, you know, hey, are, are there resources out there? We're not really sure what to do. Um, so that's something to honestly consider as well. Okay. And we've got one final question. Um, we have other questions, but I know we're running 
out of time. And sure. we just wanted to convey to our families that this is something, a discussion that we want to continue having and um, cool. figure out how we can continue to support our families. And um, this is not going to be the end, but right. just with the sake of time, just wanted to see if you can um, finish up with what is the best way to let my child know that they can trust me? I have a very easy answer to that one. You can remind your child that you love them and that they are always welcome to share anything with you, even if it's hard information. So and I, I, I think the, the most important thing, and this is what I, what I wanna stress, because I, I see this anxiety with parents often, this can be very easy. And when I say easy, I'm not referring to all the, the LGBT stuff and, and the discussions and the conversation, but being able to remind your child on a daily basis that they can tell you anything, even if it's not the easiest information, is a very simple task to do. Todd, thank you so much for tonight. Um, just you brought a, a wealth of information and we're so appreciated appreciate that a lot of our families attended tonight's presentation. And like mm -hmm. um, I had mentioned before, this is a conversation that we want to continue. Um, and just a reminder that this uh, presentation tonight is going to be posted on the CBUSD uh, YouTube web channel. So you can access it there. And we just want to tell everyone to have a wonderful night and then we'll look forward to seeing you in future presentations. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Todd.